So good afternoon, my name is Steve Wise. I am the Vice President of Statistical Methods for Infinity QS, and I've been playing in the world of, of uh, statistics and manufacturing environments since about 1986. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is how, do, how can you use statistical methods to slash your costs? And I see a lot of times where folks use SPC, but um, you know, we're only getting half the benefit of the data. So I want to talk about, we just have 20 minutes today, so I won't have time to go into a lot of the areas that, uh, that we could cover, but uh, we'll go through a couple of good examples here. So let's first talk about waste. And waste is a, is a, is a very broad uh, term, but if we take a simple example of you've got various operations, and each operation, there could be a little bit of waste that can come out of each operation. So we go through operations one, two, three, and they all have some component of waste associated with that. And all that waste just goes into the great big trash bin, and waste can be measured in time, can be waste could be measured in materials or resources, any activities that, that come into play when there's waste going on, that all just gets, uh, gets trashed. And, we, and we're paying for that. I'm paying for it, you're paying for it, everyone pays for that. And all this, when we talk, sometimes people refer to that as our hidden factory, all this activity that goes on, but it doesn't generate any profits. And so uh, there are hidden factories. You've heard of hidden factories from uh, World War II times. I'm thankful for certain hidden factories. I, I was raised just outside of Oak Ridge. So my forefathers and myself were all grateful for hidden factories. And, and the Boeing company, if you've been to the Boeing tour, that plant was hidden during a World War II times. But the kind of hidden factories that I'd like to talk about are ones that we want to expose. And so how do we get to these, these hidden factories? So um, when we think about reducing cost, then a lot of times we, we've heard the, the, uh, the stories of SPC. So let's apply some basic SPC methods and see how far we can get. So if we have, here's your basic run chart. It's, 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 those of you that are statisticians out here, you can see that, that I'm dealing with individual X plot points up there. So mathematically, it's safe to put spec limits on the same chart as control limits. So I'm not violating anything uh, mathematical there. But I can see here I've got 18 plot points. I can count how many of these are out of spec. So I've got seven fallout out of 18. So we can get some numbers off of that. I can see that it's not capable. So if you can see the small print over here on the right hand side where the CPKs are, those are pretty bad numbers. But this chart really does nothing more than provide capability and out of spec visibility. And that's all good. It's good to see the trends and so forth, but it's not really addressing the cost associated with this, this type of activity. The other type of, of control charts are your attribute charts. So we're counting defects. And so there's a lot of activities, especially in the name of Six Sigma, where we're counting up our defects and tallying those up. And we have attribute charts to check that. And so here's my C chart, I'm counting defects, and on average, every sample I take, I'm getting 6.7 defects per subgroup. So again, it shows trends, it shows defect counts, but it, this is still not addressing the cost. But yet, a lot of you, and a lot, a lot of companies are spending money and, and already collecting data, but they're not getting all the value out of this data. Let's look at another type of tool that is very common, this is the good old histogram or capability analysis. Those numbers are, are kind of hard to see, but if you, if you if we look at a few of the, the stats here, I've got 40% fallout, so there's about 20% on, on the low side, 20% on the high side. You can kind of intuitively look at, well, one side's a scrap side, one side's a rework side, and you can talk about it, but it's not really down to the hard cost with that. We also report numbers like CPKs and sigma levels, and we feel good and bad about those numbers, but again, it's not dealing with the costs. So I want to go through a couple of examples Assuming that you're already collecting this kind of data, what additional few things can you do to start gather, gathering your costs with this? And so here is just the spreadsheet view of that, that first chart that I had where we've got 18 pieces of, of information. So I've got 18 pieces there. And of those, seven of those fell out. So if we just did something as simple as put a cost component in there, in this case, the, fa the factor value, you can see the column is has 17.25. So that's what I've assigned to this as the cost. If we have to scrap this part at this operation, my value add to this point is $17.25. And so you can do some math and figure that out. And then at any time where things are dropping out, just multiply it by that factor and you can start tallying up some costs there. But that's, this is a very um, immature way of looking at costs. And it kind of goes back to this goal posting business to where the, the, the historical philosophy is, the conventional philosophy is, Anything that falls within the upper and lower spec limit is all 100% good. There's no loss whatsoever. Only when it goes outside the spec limit, then we have total loss at that point. But those of you that, that have heard of and, have, and believe in the Taguchi philosophy, which has been around for years, what Taguchi 
says is that anytime you're, you deviate from your target, there's costs associated with it. So it it's pretty much has just been a philosophical discussion that, that motivates us to try to drive towards targets. But how can we take this knowledge and actually apply hard math to it and get some hard costs out of it? So depending on the, the type of um, test you're measuring, that loss function curve could be different. So you can, you can figure out what the best guess of the loss function curve is in your situation, make an equation out of that, and then apply that to your number. So as you get a value that falls a little bit off target, you're applying this, this equation curve to it to get the cost associated with it. So if we take the assumption that as soon as it hits the upper spec limit or the lower spec limit, it's a $17.25 or $17.25 loss, if we just, in this case, my example here is just drawing a line, a straight line, a linear line from the target of zero up to 17 and a quarter, and we're going to get uh, some costs associated with that. But you can put higher level math in there if you want. So with the example here, again, our target is, is in this case, is two point, or I'm sorry, 7.5. The part cost is 17.25. And so I've got this, uh, this sample um, data entry window, and I'm in the business, Infinity QS, and we've probably heard of our company. We've been in the business of collecting data and doing real-time SPC for years. And this is just screenshots from our software. But um, here it is, I've got my outside diameter at 7.5. So therefore, since that's running dead nuts, I'm, I have no fallout whatsoever so that the, uh, not sure if you, can, if you can read that gray, where's my mouse here? It says outside diameter, uh, out of spec count, which is zero. And then the, the Taguchi loss is zero as well because I'm running right on target. If we take the other example where I'm, I'm right at seven, or right at, uh, let's see, the upper spec limit is 10. So if I get a value that falls at 10, I still don't have any fallout, but yet I've realized all my costs. So it's still a 17.25 cost there. So if it goes to 10.01, what will my fallout be at that point? I'll have a fallout one eye, so I get a hit of one, but what happens to the Taguchi value, the, the loss, at 10.01 at, at versus 10.0? Is there much difference? Is the 1725 gonna change that much? No, it won't, it won't change hardly at all. We're just multiplying the factor times 10.01 rather than 10, so it'll be, you know, maybe, uh, $17.26 instead of the 25. So, but we play games, don't we? We play games with, if it's barely in spec, it's good, but if it's barely out of spec, it's bad, and we either scrap it or we, we put it into MRB, and we call people in, they call the customer, get, get uh, you know, use as is designations on that or deviations and so forth, and so we're playing games ourselves, and, but all that costs money to play those games. So there are costs associated with it, if we take a couple of other examples, here's a value that came in at eight, so it's well within spec, but if we compare it to the loss function, we've got a loss of um, $3.45 at that point, or we take something that's way out of spec, the loss just keeps going. So it doesn't stop at 17 and a quarter, we keep applying the math to it, and it's a $31 loss at that point. The reason for that is, is if that part escapes and gets further down the line and more value add gets put into it, then you, you need to add more value or you know, cost when you discover it. And the further down it gets, the more cost when it gets discovered. So, so you really need to give credit, you know, apply the math even though it's, it's out of spec. All right, so let me go back one. So here, now that we have these, these statistics that are actually numbers of cost, why can't we put those on control charts? Well, we can. So here's a control chart for every sample we take. We calculate the cost and then have a cost control chart on this. And, so the, uh, the red line is the upper spec limit, that's the 1725 line, but the center line on that is 14.99. So it's basically, it's a $15 on average loss every part we make. Even though not all of them are out of spec, we can start you know, calculating that. And so when it comes time to justifying what it costs to try to bring the process on target, or to reduce variation about that target, if you start looking at it this way, you might get to your return on investment faster if you're making investments and trying to get it on target. If you wanted to uh, drill that even further and try to isolate the culprits, add more descriptive information to your data. So for example, you know, lot numbers or shift or operator, in this case I've got a five spindle operation, assign that to the data and then you can calculate uh, further down as to where the, the problems are residing. So spindles three and spindle two, since they tend to run off target more than the other spindles, that's where most of your costs are. 
even if nothing ever went out of spec, you're still going to start accumulating costs if you apply the Taguchi loss function curve to this. And so now I can see overall when I ran part one, if you look at the yellow bar, everything to the right, I've got $285 I've accumulated for that, and then I can see it divided up into the different spindles. So that's, uh, that's one approach, is just taking the loss function, deviation from target, and applying some actual math to that. It's fairly simple, you're, you're already spending the money on the data, you may as well just put some free math behind it and start getting those dollars. If you're in a filling operation, or any time where you're, you're trying to uh, hold, where you're doing volumetric type measurements or filling operations, then there's giveaway that you're, that's, is where a lot of waste and, and, and uh, dollars go. So in our simple example here, I've got a can of mixed vegetables, it's a filling operation. I've got a label stated content of 567 grams that are on there. Anything over label stated content is giveaway. Anything under is a violation. So if we, if we target the process on 567 grams, how much of the product is going to be a giveaway? We'll, we'll fall in, how much will fall in the giveaway category? Half. Half will, half will have some sort of giveaway associated with it and how much of our product is going to be in violation. Half will be in violation as well. So we, we're in, this, in this condition, we don't want to target on the label stated, do we? We want to target above label stated, but the question is, how far above do we need to run this? And it really, if you play these, these numbers, it's a function of the standard deviation and a function of how well can you hold a target. So that's kind of getting into your controls. You know, how stable is your process? And as you reduce, if you can reduce your standard deviation, you, you can run it closer to label stated without having fallout problems on the violation side. So let's, let's look at this, but we still want to calculate giveaway, right? Because every bit of giveaway is justifying whatever money it might cost to reduce your variation or, or to get better equipment or, or whatnot. So uh, we want to always calculate giveaway. So it's very simple math. We just set the, um, the lower spec limit at 567 grams. I've, I've, I've arbitrarily set a target of 577 grams, an upper spec of 587 grams, but we want to run it above target, above label stated. So if we look at the math here, and I know I'm going down to four decimal places, which is kind of silly, but I just did some, some random number generation here. So I came in at 571.56 grams. I subtract that off my 567 label stated, and I come up with a 4.56 gram giveaway. So I do that on all five cans. My sample size is five in this case. And so now I can continue to do some additional math. So you can, if you follow along the top of the spreadsheet there, I take those five readings and I get an average giveaway of 4.79. So that's that number there. So on average, 4.79 grams per can is what I'm giving away. And then, I, then I'll do some math with, let's say you're doing samples every 15 minutes or every hour, whatever your sampling uh, frequencies are. You want to find out how many cans have passed through and then, and then do some math on that to where the number of cans since I last did my last check was 1,092 cans, so almost 1,100 cans have passed through. So I take my number of cans, multiply it by the average giveaway for that sample, and I can come up with an average giveaway, or the giveaway during that last sampling period of 500 or 5,473 grams. And then I multiply that times a per gram cost, which down here is you know, a hundredth of a penny, basically but I multiply that out and in between my last sample, I gave away $8.42, right? And so as I continue my lot run, I'm sampling throughout the lot, every sample I get, I'm also calculating the giveaway. So my total giveaway for that run was $35.28. So now we can take these numbers and start, and start tallying up my giveaway. So on my part, uh, well, this, I'm calling part three my, my mixed vegetable uh, can, when I ran that job, I gave away $72 worth of product, and I can see lot 102 was 35 bucks, and lot 101 was 30, 37 bucks effectively, and I can add those up. So again, you're gonna be doing your weights anyway. You may as well do the math and calculate the giveaway and use that to justify any improvement efforts that you want to, to spend to, uh, to bring that in. Or even better yet, you may, be, you may not know what's going on with your Sigma. You may be better than you think you are, and you're running way above target more than you need, and if you did nothing except understand what your sigmas are and you're stable, you can dial that down and, and, and you can dial it and actually predict how much giveaway are you willing to live with. And depending on what the feds or the governing bodies are saying, if you can give away 2%, dial it down to where statistically you're, you're trying to get a 2% giveaway. All right, so that's uh, some value of just having the numbers to know what those are. So other areas and ways to slash cost. 
you can, you know, we talk about reducing inspection. Well, imagine if you're, you're doing, if you're doing in-process checks on one end, and then you've got final inspection that has sampling plans on the other, your sampling plans are telling you on a particular lot size, I've got to sample 12 pieces or whatever the number is. Well, some of those features that you're sampling at final, you're also checking in process. If you make sure that the samples and, and the sampling or the uh, measurement systems and so forth are, are good enough on the floor, give yourself credit for that and have the software keep up with, well, I've already done seven of these tests on the floor, so in my final, I just have to do two of them that require specialized equipment maybe they don't have on the floor. So you can reduce inspection that way. And then, then we get, that gets into the, the duplicate inspections. We can eliminate some of the redundant inspection. And then um, if, if you're always good and you've got a track record of being good and mathematically and statistically over time you see you're good, you can start expanding the amount of time between when you do the checks, so that costs less money. And then this idea of smaller sample sizes. A lot of times we deal with the, with the mill standard 105D or, 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 or I think it's 414 or something where it's just old school type sampling plans and the sample sizes are very, very big. If you look up lot tolerance percent defective sampling plans, LTPD plans, those are actually much smaller sample sizes. They, has, they take on more of, of the known knowledge of your statistics and you can actually reduce your sampling sizes if you look at the LTPD type sampling plans. Also, if you know, after you, you know what the process capabilities are, you know what you're trying to achieve with the jobs that are coming in, you can, you can better match your job to the equipment out there so you're not wasting your expensive tight tolerance equipment running jobs that don't require all the tight tolerances. So don't, don't bottleneck the, uh, the better equipment when uh, you don't have to. Also, if you know what your process capabilities are, then you can decide when a job comes in, should I really attempt to make this? Because I like to think of statistics as the science of predicting the future. And so once you understand what your process capabilities are, you can actually look at a job, look at the tolerances you're trying to hold on that, and actually predict your fallout before you ever, ever run the job. And if you know you're going to be fighting this, you know, look at the prices of what a supplier will do it for you and farm it out if it makes sense. So you can, you can better justify your, your make-by decisions on that. But it, even if you don't make any improvements, you have no money, the technology is what it is, I still want to run the job, then be honest with yourself and just order enough material. If you know you're going to have 17% fallout, order 20% more, whatever it is, and just be honest with yourself. It's, it's much better to order additional material than to run out in the middle of the job and have to call stores to get more in or heaven forbid, wait for suppliers to, uh, to bring you the extra, the extra product. And then also account for enough time. If you know you're gonna have fallout, you're willing to live with it, it's not, the ROI is not there yet to, to make things better, then account for enough time for the job. You're gonna have to sort parts, you're gonna have to uh, disposition things and do the rework, so you know, account for that and, and embed that into your estimates. And then where else? You know, really there's, there's just two statistics and, and a fact that you have to understand about your process is to make these predictions and that is, where's my mean, you know, based on, here's my, my set point, how well can I hold that set point, how much variation is it around that set point, and is it stable over time? So those, that's just your control charts that are doing that, giving you that information. If you had that, you know, where else could you use this knowledge? So um, in, in this, in this example, I've given you just two little examples. So or in, this, uh, this, in this short time we have together. So you've got hidden factors. We all have our hidden factors. They're costing you money. So let's uh, figure out how to expose those. And in my submission, if you're going to invest in collecting the data, then I submit that you, you ought to embed some uh, cost tallies into your, your standard QC checks and SPC checks, add a little bit more math to it, and uh, get those costs associated with that. Consider the Taguchi loss function curve. A lot of times we'll, uh, you know, your, our bosses will say, well, I'm running everything, it's, they're always in spec, we can't justify making improvements. Well, we all know that, that, that if, if, if I'm on operation 10 and operation 11 is expecting my product to be on target, but it's actually everything on the high side, I'm gonna cause operation 11 problems in many cases, even though it's all in spec. So there is something to the Taguchi loss function curve, so use that to help calculate your costs. Giveaway is a great place to uh, also, if, that, if, you, if you're in that volume metric, in, in the filling operation, label stated content type operations, then uh, it's a great way to start to looking to slash your costs. And look for other areas where costs can be incorporated. So um, that's the end of my discussion. I, I hope it was worth the uh, 18 or so minutes that you had. I hope we give you some, some decent ideas and I appreciate your time.